computer. Okay, right. So, um, viewers, I'm here today um, as part of the Sacred Land podcast series with um, Mark Townsend. But first of all, I'm just going to give a small intro about myself and why I'm here. So, I'm Sarah Proudfoot Clinch, a filmmaker, a holistic therapist, and a passion for archaeology. Uh, I've always wanted to make a film about sacred land, looking at our ancestors, how they lived, and what we can learn from them now. Then COVID-19 hit us, and along with that came lockdowns, which has seen an increase in mental health sufferers and suicides. So if we think about that, we had really high mental health suffering and suicidal thought people who wanted to commit suicide and people who have committed suicide and now it's gone even higher so um, mm. my proposed film sacred land seeks solutions in sacred landscapes and mother nature the simplicity of mother nature as our ancestors did i started this podcast series called sacred lands to invite the viewers to follow me on my journey to find funding for the film and a commissioning editor. Um, and uh, if you know anyone who might want to fund the film, then please get in touch. Um, also, along the way, you, the viewers, can meet the lovely guests and experts in their fields and learn more about sacred landscapes, mental health and healing. Um, you can find links to my websites below. And if you enjoy the podcast, I thought I'd never say these things, but apparently you have to. <laughs> if you enjoy the podcast, please click on the link, no, cl click on the like <laughs> button and subscribe to my channel. And you can find out more information about me and my other films from my website, www.proudfootpodcasts.co.uk. Now the interesting part. This is the intro to my lovely guest, um, Mark Townsend, who served as an Anglican priest for just over a dec decade before going freelance. He now prefers to be known as a hedge priest, a term I personally adore, because his vocation has taken him to the in-between places. As well as being a priest, Mark is also a member of the Magic Circle. As he says... I am a priest because I seek to awaken everyone to their own priesthood and I am a magician because I seek to awaken everyone to their own magic. A beautiful phrase. Uh, Mark has had the privilege of creating and leading special ceremonies for people for over 25 years and often uses magical effects and illusions within them. Originally ordained through the Church of England in 1996, his journey has taken him through many different paths and experiences. He is now a member of the Association of Independent Celebrants. His background enables him to see things from a variety of perspectives. Thus, his ceremonies often include insights and ideas, poems, and passages from many of the world faiths, or indeed some of the more rational and scientific approaches to life. A number of people struggle to relate to formal religion, and when faced with trauma of planning a funeral, wedding, or other ceremony, they often assume there are only two alternatives, an official minister of religion or a humanist celebrant. Mark, Mark's work, oh. <laughs> I thought I turned that off, but I was waiting for your email. I do apologise, power off. Okay, viewers, <laughs> boo-boo. Uh, Mark's okay. work bridges the gap between the two with services that draw upon his own experiences and they can be completely non-religious, religious, spiritual or somewhere in between. Mark has also written several books, I couldn't list them all, very interesting books, including The Gospel of Falling Down, which I rather love, uh, The Wizard's Gift, and Jesus Outside the Box. 
In recent years, this lovely hedge priest has been called upon to conduct more and more outdoor ceremonies than ever before. And this is what I'm very much looking forward to hearing more about. So without further ado, I'm delighted to welcome you, Mark Townsend, to this Sacred Land podcast. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. And I'm so thrilled to be invited. I feel really humbled to be you know, I'm um, part of this. It's it's a really exciting project. So I do oh, wish you well with it. Thank you thank very you. much. <laughs> so it, well, we can start. There's so many places to start because we have got a, yeah. a varied background, which is full and rich and fabulous for a celebrant. Um, so let's start with Hedge Priest. What, where yeah. did that idea come from? And um, how do you see yourself as a, head, a Hedge Priest? Explain a little bit more. Well, for a start, a hedge, of course, is is something between two gardens or two fields. Um, it's something, but it, as you said before, it's it's a between place. It's a space, and I mean, um, the, quite frankly, the um, the term was given to me by a group of beautiful druid people because I, as a as a vicar, I was very interested in the pagan religions and druidry, mm -hmm. and uh, nature based. Uh, spiritualities and I spent lots of time with them um, so much so that in fact I'm sitting on a Franciscan habit which has got <laughs> olive which, which which has got oak uh, leaves oh, embroidered oh, there. Oh, this, this, was, this was given to me by one of the druids who said um, you know this used to belong to a Franciscan it's become a druid Franciscan um, oh. habit and, and gave it to me and said you must be a hedge priest because I, I'm sort of a bit of both so I thought that was just so wonderful and I yeah I wear this all the time now it's just it's my favorite um sort of well, outdoor it's, it's <laughs> sacred but it, <laughs> exactly but I, I I discovered um that actually hedge priests uh, it is a term that goes back to the medieval church and um it was they were called vagabond priests they were priests who didn't have a have a place to sort of lay their head they were wandering mm -hmm. um troubadour type clergy who weren't very kind of uh, establishment so um i mean i would have thought someone like francis of assisi was like mm -hmm. a, i mean he was a, he wasn't a priest he was a monk but uh, or a friar but that's the sort of idea someone who's standing between places and i i don't fit very comfortably in any box i've tried so many and I've loved most of them, but I don't fit comfortably within any one. I like to be free and, you know. Well, at the, the fluidity, <laughs> the fluidity of freedom is where mm. the creativity and the imagination can flow. And yeah. when you're put into a box or a label, um, it, it is that. It's boxed you in. Mm. And, and it, yeah, doesn't, absolutely. it doesn't feel comfortable. So... We mm. also, before we move on to other subjects, you are also a magician, which is fascinating. And um, how <laughs> do you incorporate that within your uh, you know, ceremonies or your... Yeah, so I'm a magician in the... Um, in the illusion sense, in the sense of I'm someone who does tricks and, and creates pictures by using magical effects. So, um, and... Um, and that's not to kind of play it down at all because some would say that's that's a sort of cheap form of magic whereas you know um real magic is is to do with um the sort of um you know uh, um the magic of kind of uh, ceremonial magic and stuff like that but i i mean i i'm a, i'm a, a, a magician in the sense of someone who, who does card tricks who does tricks with coins and and sometimes mind reading and i use that as an analogy or as a um a way of pointing to the magic that is everywhere so to me there's no distinction and actually if you go back far oh you far enough in the world of religion it all began with magic okay Mark, <laughs> i'm you're back frozen you're not back uh, oh you're back now oh i don't know that was ah, you were talking okay. about illusion and you froze <laughs> Okay. Um, yes. Yeah, so you were talking. You don't have to go very far back. There we go. So you were saying no, you don't I have mean, to go very far it's, back it's, in time it's... before. Yeah, I mean, you can see you can see glimpses of 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 magic as in sleight of hand. I think you've frozen again. No, no, we haven't. I oh, know. No, <laughs> no, no. no. Um, I th you see glimpses of of magic um, in all sorts of religious traditions, even though a lot of them don't admit it. Um, so, for example, there's a beautiful 
tradition in around Easter time in Jerusalem, where the Orthodox Church, um, they send their patriarch into the, the, the place where they believe Jesus um, was buried. And he goes in with two wonderful Paschal candles and no cigarette lighter, and he comes out with them lit. Now, <laughs> we all know how those candles get lit. But it's a trick. I mean, it's a beautiful bit of magic because everybody yeah. comes out and, and God or the angels have lit the magic. So that that is using um, quite a simple form of, of, of magic to mm. to kind of to bring in some mystery and wonder. If you think of people like Sai Baba, the Indian mystic, um, yeah, I know he would Baba say. Well. Right. So his his sort of, um, you know, his use of illusion is 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 to kind of generate that incredible um, openness to the real magic which is all around us and yeah. and so to me I don't in any way um kind of see magic as a as just a, a sort of trivial sort of bit of gimmickry it's something really profoundly beautiful which and actually also, enables and people are in awe of most times yeah bring up magic bring magic into things and so yeah it puts people at ease it also mm -hmm. it not only does it put them at ease but it's it's fabulous to see, you know, mm. magic is fabulous. There's magic all yeah. around us, all around us in yeah. nature, in the forests, yeah. in the woodlands. Um, and then mm. to have that, have an element of it in any a, yeah. a wedding ceremony or a naming ceremony, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing. So um, what I was going to say was, uh, so you're a hedge priest, you're a magician, and you do more and more outdoor ceremonies. So would you like to tell us why people are choosing outdoor ceremonies and what it's like for you in yeah. doing them the traditional formal way? Okay, so first of all, um, most most ceremonies that I do are still within a, a church or generally a crematorium. And they're also very magical and, and beautiful because every single uh, ritual, even if they're very, very sad, is a, a place, it's a rite of passage, it's yeah. a place to connect people. And, and whether they're atheists or believers of, of whatever, it, they're still very powerful, magical spaces. But yes, we, we're doing more and more ceremonies in woodlands, um, funerals. Um, I do a lot at a place called Humber Woodland, which I was going to be uh, situated at for this interview, but it all it fell apart because of this. <laughs> um, but um, it's, I, I think what it is, is, is partly because people are naturally drawn to nature and have mm -hmm. discovered that you can do these things outside of the confines of buildings but also because people are realizing that there are there are just more ways to, to celebrate life or birth uh, marriage and, and and death um so many more ways uh, people are co cottoning on to the idea of celebrants rather than clergy but e even um i know plenty of clergy who do outdoor woodland cer ceremonies as well so it's not just a, a sort of um a non religious thing at all mm. in fact that i don't even like this i don't even like the distinction between religious and non-religious because it's sort of mm. almost it can it can actually denigrate both sides it mm. can make the one side say oh we're not this and um to me every ritual is powerful and, and beautiful and, and, and sacred and important. Um, yeah you know yeah so, yeah so i looked at your but website to do to, to do a to do a funeral for example at um yeah oh right so we frozen looked, again oh sorry darling. have you got me am i frozen am i with you yeah i got you okay it's right. okay so um i looked at your website and i looked at all these fantastic photographs of you in the woodland setting with you know literally mm. the earth mm. is the ground from mm. the woodland and um the chairs mm. are all mm. around on the on the ground and the mm. trees are mm. all around you and the leaves above you mm. and it's mm. it's oh my word it's fat it looks amazing mm. mark and it is it is pure magic and and to have um to be so close to nature when you are having mm. a funeral or any ceremony mm. it's mm. It seems blessed. It seems very yeah. sacred it, to do it that way. It is. And not that it's not sacred in churches and crematoriums. I agree with you. But that business of being so close to nature, 
is being mm. more connected somehow. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And um, and the fact that you, in, in Humber, which is this beautiful place I was talking about, um, you rarely need music because it's there. You know, you can hear sheep, oh. you can hear the lambs, you can hear birds, it's saturated with birds, different varieties. Raven, they've got a, ra a nest of ravens sort of, sort of, you know, croaking in the background, which is a, a beautiful thing for a, a, a funeral because of mm. the, the sort of symbolism, symbolism of the raven being that, you know. Um, and you so it's- the wind rustling it, through the trees. The wind, yeah. So you don't yeah. need music. People often bring music and a lot of it will be acoustic and played, which is lovely, yeah. but you can stop. And I, and I always get people to stop and just pause and take in the beauty of the, of the, of the, the, the life of this place that is being um, a, a marker of, of somebody's death. So it's a kind of strange, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, um, it, it is quite wonderful. Um, and then, um, of course, people also have a lot more time. So there's no 30 minute sort of, you know, you've got to go by the clock oh, in, yeah, in crematorium. Yeah. yeah. So there's none of that. You can take your time. Um, people seem to also be more free to come forward and, and speak that there's there's something about stepping up to a lectern in a in a room that is much more off putting than mm. than gathering around a space together yeah. and holding hands and speaking. Um, so yeah, it's a it's a very different um, experience, and of course, sorry, go. Oh, no, 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 oh, no. Carry on. If you've got something. No, I say yeah. It does. It, it's it sort of ties in when I was saying about my relationship with the the, the pagan, the, the druids. You know, of course, most of their cer ceremonies, well, all of all druid ceremonies, are outside in circles. So it kind of ties in very much with that, and and it always feels much more. Um, it feels very sacred, actually, and, and I think to me more so than within a building because it is just it, it's mm. uh, it's God's temple, you know. Mm. It's a it's God's a natural, natural cathedral. Natural. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I've got um, uh, a gentleman that I interviewed in Kingley Vale who um, is uh, Richard Williamson, and mm -hmm. he's a very older gentleman. This was some some years back. And he was the guardian of Kingley Vale, which is a 3,000 year old yew tree forest. Incredible. The Druids yeah. love it. It's near mm. Chichester. Mm. And uh, he, he's, you know, white hair, bearded, socks up to his <laughs> knees, shorts down <laughs> to his knees, you know, really um, quite traditional and formal. But he, he was a wonderful spirit himself. And he said that mm. he felt like he went to church every day when he's walking through the woodland because you've got the gnarled mm. roots uh, of the trees, the old yew trees, mm. uh, connecting mm. him to Mother Earth. And then he said you've got these tall, sh you know, shafts and then the, the branches at the top connecting you to the heavens above. And he said mm. this is the natural church. This is my mm. sacred mm. space. Mm. And um, yeah. I, I just love that completely. And... I also, yeah. it, it makes me think of what you were saying just now about buildings. You know, I wonder about our mental health when we, we work, live, sleep, eat, breathe and play in concrete buildings. Mm -hmm. So a lot of us know mm -hmm. that it's really good for mm -hmm. us to go out for a walk in the woodlands or find some open space with the green and the trees. But some people have just, you know, the, the humanity has, is veering mm. towards uh, screens and mobile phones and mm. spending more time mm. like that. So mm. the concrete building element is where mm. I think we have become yeah. disconnected mm. from ourselves and disconnected, yeah. therefore, with, yeah. from Mother Nature. And so the healing comes... Yeah. I think just from that walk in the woodlands or walk in, in a grassy open mm. space, um, mm. Mm. you know, and you get to, it's, you get to work it, in it and have it all around you as well. Exactly. And, and I'm quite a, I'm a person who needs it because I'm quite a heady. I'm very much in my head yeah. and I, I sometimes can't get out of it. And I, I get, I do get depressed. I get low. Um, and, and this last year of COVID I've got incredibly, mm. um, 
I just dragged down really by the by the the, the, the sheer weight of seeing such pain in people you know mm -hmm. it's been really hard mm -hmm. so to me I, I go I go into the woods and, I, and that's where I'll write or I'll, I'll mm -hmm. um, I don't want to make out that I'm some kind of um, you know Franciscan saint I mean crumbs you know I, I, I've got full of holes but I and I and I don't practice what I preach I wish I did but I know that the minute that's I get all of us. to <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but the minute I get too much in here, yeah. I go to, and, and there's a place where I wrote that book, The, the Wizard's Gift that you mentioned. And it's a beautiful, um, it's, a, it's a, a, a chair that's been made out of the wood that was already there and it's carved with a wizard. <gasps> and it's just, it's absolutely, and that's where I met the wizard and, and sort of wrote the book about it. So these places are, yeah, they plug us back into ourselves and they plug us mm. back into mm. to life and, and they connect us. And that 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 sense of the funny thing is, well, um, I, I did listen to um, that wonderful interview that you with Satish um, Kumar is amazing. Um, and you were talking about this, um, you know, the difference in sort of urban areas and rural. Now I'm in a rural area and there is a lot of um there's a lot more deprivation and a lot more sort of in the head that, than, you, than you'd imagine there's a lot more i think there's a higher suicide rate actually in rural areas mm -hmm. interestingly than urban and so i don't think it's just a matter of being around nature it's a matter of actually switching off and 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 sort of learning to see it because you know we can i can i can be close to I can see it now at my windows. It's, it's, it's all green out there, but I can be stuck in this head, mm. and that's the problem. We have completely um, become sort of head people, and and that is a disconnect with yourself. Mm. So yeah, absolutely. As you say one doesn't need to be in nature for healing. One mm. can. It is about you know coming out of the head and coming back into the soul, mm. and yeah, I think that with all the screens and the robotic you know sort of lifestyle that is promoted mm. as uh, mm. the way one lives and as acceptable when it is not acceptable it mm. takes us away from ourselves and mm. from our mm. creativity our soul our imagination mm. and all of mm. the things that when you are in in sacred nature or mother nature um, which could mm. even just be, you know, walking by the sea as well. Um, mm. uh, it's this anything to do with nature. Again, as mm. I said, for people living in high rise blocks of flats, you know, it, if your nature is a, a mm. glass of flowers or a plant on the windowsill, um, it can bring you to a place that is not here. Mm. Because if you mm. focus on the petals of a flower, yeah. I have a flower mm. here, I'm just looking at it, right? So if we take that and we look at the pet, oh, how do I do it? <laughs> yeah. yeah, and we look yeah, at the petals. Because, that's yeah. all you have if you're, if that's all you've got. And you start to focus on each petal and look at the detail and look at how incredible mother nature is. It can, mm. it can bring you back to a place which mm. is within your soul. And I think, more of that needs to be um, brought out into the open rather than mm. the robotic uh, lifestyle, the long hours, the no lunch breaks, mm. Um, mm. people under pressure, 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 pressure. Really, mm. why do we need to mm. live like that? Can, you know, as mm. you said, can we not look to, look, to live a mm. more decent life where people yeah. can be happy yeah. and enjoy their work? Um, yeah. But, Okay, okay, so sorry for that little blip. So, <laughs> okay. the, so the mental health statistics are, uh, mm. you know, important for us to understand the severity and mm. the, you know, the, uh, the situation that we're in now. Mm. More people mm. experienced mental health issues during COVID nineteen than ever recorded before, and they haven't mm. really even started to secure the findings. Um, Teenage suicides are on the rise. That hurts yeah. any human, any society mm. that can say that mm. needs mm. to understand that we're in pain mm. as a society, mm. as a human mm. being. Um, mm. Police are being contacted by helplines to attend homes for attempted suicides 
from people as young as 16 years old, 13 mm -hmm. years old, and 11 years old. Gosh. So if we think yeah. about that, you've got the, the child is on the helpline uh, saying mm. they want to commit suicide and they've got it all ready in their mm. bedroom. And mm. then you've mm. got the police coming to the house to knock on the door. The parents are downstairs cooking or making, uh, mm. making a cake or watching TV and mm. their child is upstairs about to take their life. Mm. So the, the knock-on, the ramifications, you know, more often than not, they say they, they save the situation, but there have been occasions, mm. the police said, mm. where they haven't. So mm. that's, again, mm. another trauma. But, you know, it's, mm. it's big thoughts. Um, and it's three, terrifying. It is, yeah. And three quarters yeah. of all suicides in the UK are male. Mm. Yeah. So the, the male society has, has been hit hard with mm. the pressure of living in the world the way the world is structured now. Yeah. And it's, it's not that long ago that I did a funeral for a, a chap I knew quite well, and he took his own life through the COVID situation. Mm. Um, and um, nobody knew, nobody saw it coming. But it was two things. It was it was the loss of his job, and um, and that was the loss of his purpose. And then the loss of his social life. He was a, a single man who very, very fun, fun loving, sp spent most nights having a couple of jars at the, at the local pub. Everybody loved him there. And um, both of those were, were cut off from him. So he was cut off from everybody. And mm -hmm. it's just so. And, and of course, the family were, were not really aware because he was such an outwardly fun loving guy. And yeah. of course, because lockdown meant we didn't see each other so mm. and there must be there must be thousands of cases like that which yeah yeah and, and where and, else do you begin to... and with the research you know when there's been several documentaries made including ronan kemp the son of martin kemp the singer mm. made a fantastic mm. documentary about suicide and mental health suffering um not just through covid but in general mm. and the youth you know and then the young males and he, it, it was, it came about from all these, you know, teenagers, and as well as interviewing older people, that it's, it's often the, you know, bubbly, fun-loving people, um, and they mm. never, ever give any indication. No. So even no. without COVID, it's, mm. um, it's a, it's a sadness deep in the heart that mm. I think COVID has exacerbated that, as you say, through isolation mm. and also mm. the pressure of losing income. I mean, that's not mm. even discussed. Yeah. It on, no. I, you know, in I don't watch the news, but I know what's going on in the multimedia. And it's mm. not discussed, the fact that there is a huge economic ramifications mm. from a and year I... and, nearly a year and a half coming up to Mm. of uh, locking down people's businesses and uh, their incomes. I mean, uh, 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 and my fear is that that's just the tip of the iceberg. Yes, exactly. Because, because exactly. what's going to happen in the next few years, um, I just have no oh, idea. Uh, you know, exactly. Yeah. People's mortgages. Are they going to yeah. be able to keep their homes? What's going to happen when there isn't enough income to pay all? Well, it's, it's been going on for many mm. people throughout mm. the, the mm. first year of lockdowns. So mm, these mm. are huge mental pressures. And then yeah, one in five yeah. people will have suicidal thoughts. So there's mm. two of us here. And, mm. um, you know, that's if you put another three people on this Zoom, one of mm. us will have had suicidal thoughts. And it, I just think we need to bring these, you know, um, these statistics out into the open and encourage more and more openness about the topic. Yeah, yeah. And especially since we're not going to go back to the way the world used to be. It's no. changed. Yeah. There's still so much um, stigma. And um, I don't mind, for some reason, I, I've never 
really minded being totally transparent you know mm. I get depressed mm. years back I had horrible thoughts along those lines um you know that's that's life we're human that's what that gospel of falling down is all about you know it's it's, mm. it's we are human beings we are full of of um flaws beautiful flaws actually but flaws nevertheless um but I mean I, th I think there are things happening dear old Prince Harry you know he, he's he's done wonders with talking about things yeah. like this in public you know yeah. bless him um other people um you know it's and 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 for men um and, I, and I'm saying that not in a kind of sexist way but, but, but a lot of traditional men don't like talking from the heart mm. so to hear men talking you know in a way that is um because you know I'm, I'm quite shocked by that one in 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 four sorry three in four people who commit suicide are a men you know i find that, that three quarters utterly... of all suicides are men yeah so that's 75 yeah, percent. So 75 percent. yeah yeah in huge. incredible um but... in fact i had one i had a policeman say to me that um if ever they have um uh, uh, news of a of a female who's taken their own life that 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 they their immediate thought is is it something else you know because it's kind of rare in certain mm. areas mm. um yeah so I don't know. It's well, um... for, for men. They say that uh, they say they, in in the young, in the documentary I watched with Ronan Kemp, um, mm. chatting to young teenagers, schoolgoers, and they were saying that um, the the boys that have had had attempted suicide and actually not, you know, uh, were saved from it. Mm. They said that they felt the pressure was um, about. Um, from society as to how will they get jobs? How will they support a family if they want a family? How are they going to get a girlfriend? Because mm. uh, they may not be attractive in the, mm. you know, mm. sense of mm. social media. Everyone is looking to be attractive mm. and, you know, mm. it's all uh, superficial and inauthentic um, mm. ways of life. Mm. And yeah. uh, their pr the pressures on them. I mean, as a teenager, I was playing in the woods. <laughs> I think about it. I was coming home from school, couldn't wait to get my school uniform off. And I went off to play in the woods. And I was still doing that age 13, you know. Mm, um, mm, mm, and some mm. girls are in nightclubs age 13 now. Yeah, you know? yeah. I mean, I holy shoot. So mm, the world... Mm. The world has changed to 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 an extent that let's recognise it and mm. understand it, not judge it. See this business, the certain the certain tools in the toolkit of um, an addict uh, who has done the twelve steps, which are mm. the best tools in the world, and those mm. surrender to something greater mm. than mm. yourself, mm. Uh, mm. forgiveness mm. of the self. Mm non-judgment yeah. um yeah patience yeah. tolerance generosity kindness these are all words that will that that resonate for people with mental health issues mm. and mm. um and as a society we can all learn from them i've always thought that and it is is mad but i think that having read a lot about um addiction and you know we all we all ha have addictions um, mm. But some are in a worse vein than others if they've gone down the drugs and the alcohol route. Mm. But mm. it's just so interesting that the tools given to the 12 steps are the tools that if we taught them the very simple rules of how to, you know, live a healthy, happy life in school, mm. we could start mm. changing society Yeah, in a yeah. way that yeah. um, is for the better. Yeah. And that's yeah. without any that doesn't cost anything really mm, does it? mm. it it's it's an inc it's an incredible thing the the 12 steps and it's got of course it's it's kind of universal in a sense because you know you can you can see glimpses of it in all different philosophies and and religions it's just that i think religions uh organized religion can kind of almost exacerbate the problem you know for example um I used to find with Christianity, and I'm 
vaguely still a Christian, I guess, um, in, a, in a qualified sense. I used to find it very success orientated. And I think the problem you've just been talking about is, is a different form of success, you know, to, in terms of, um, you know, that the whole culture of how you have to look and all of this and mm. young people. And, but there's a success even in, in spiritual traditions. You know, I've got to be Mr. Holy. I've got I've got to be the one who, who could sort of pray for half an hour without thinking, you know, even in meditative schools, mm. you can get this kind of terrible pressure on people and actually um it's all crap you know it's just about mm. being yourself mm. and and and, and if there is a god yeah, absolutely yeah real and if if there is a god and i still happen to think there is a, a god stroke goddess um we are accepted completely as we are loved as we are mm. and forgiven as we are and if we could only sort of be aware of our own beauty and also our faults and fault and, and failings then we wouldn't be so judgmental and we'd see the glory in other people mm -hmm. I mean that's that's why I am still someone who, who kind of happy to, to sort of follow the you know my my faith which is you know Christ-centered because because that's what I think he's about he's not about putting all the limelight on himself he's about throwing it back to you you know J J Jesus is who he is because everybody mm -hmm. are the same you know that exactly the same as what I said about being a priest is, is because everybody is mm. trees are priests i think mm. trees are priests a priest is something or someone that connects people the divine the, the sort of sacred and the profane that there is no profane because it's connected so trees are priests and i, I was listening to um that wonderful M matthew fox um wonderful creation spiritually spirituality teacher a couple of days ago and he said that in some parts of um and i forget which far eastern country but some of the buddhist monks are ordaining trees because it saves them from being cut down because the buddhist uh, oh. loggers isn't that a beautiful yeah. thought isn't that beautiful isn't it <laughs> isn't it just to, just to, to... It goes back to richard williamson saying that you know the trees were his sacred church and yeah. the avenue of trees was was the church mm. um mm. and and the connection to the above and below, whichever way mm. you want to think of where your, you know, um, mm. universe, your mm. higher consciousness, your your God mm. or goddess mm. is. Um, mm. Mm. So if we think of the word sacred, what mm. what does sacred mean to you? Because I've, I've called the podcast and the documentary I want to make Sacred Land. Yeah. Yeah, I think sacred is actually about recognizing what already is, because I don't think there is any anything that isn't sacred. Mm. Um, a, a church is sacred because people have consecrated it. And for years and years, people have gone in and worshipped there. So we kind of take for granted and, and the same with a, a mosque or a temple. But, um, you know, anywhere, anywhere, I was going to say anywhere where people are, anywhere where people aren't is sacred. Mm -hmm. um, and ri ritual, again, the beauty of, of um, pagan druid ritual is is that kind of marks out sacred space. It doesn't create it. It, it sort of draws a circle and says, yeah. this is, this is now, it's recognizing what already is. Yeah. I mean, I, I, th I think sacraments are the same in the church that, that you know, um, a priest doesn't marry two people a priest recognizes that those two people are married because they've already become in love. A mm. baby doesn't get baptized and, and suddenly sort of transform because some water splashed on him. The priest <laughs> splashes some water to recognize that the baby is drenched in holy water already, you know, um, and the same with um, with any same with ordination. And this really gets me in trouble with the church. Um, you know, we only ordain priests because everybody is priest. We only ordain, and same with even with Jesus, the incarnation of Jesus is to show that everybody is potentially incarnate. Mm. Um, you know, and that's it's verging into heresy in some people's eyes, but to me, that's how Very it works. Yeah. Well, yeah. It, you if know. you look at holistic health and you look at um, meditation and consciousness and mindfulness, it's all mm. about connection and connection yeah. and energy which has us thinking that we're you know some believing that we're all connected so if we're all connected to everything and everyone mm. then mm. um that connection means that if i decide to shout at someone 
I'm not only hurting mm. them, I'm hurting myself and the ramifications mm. of anybody who's around that's witnessing it. Mm. So mm. that that connection isn't quite mm. brought about in organized re religion. It isn't quite recognized mm. or discussed or energetically, um, you know, uh, no. made aware to people. And yeah. that's, again, what we're going back to what we talked about in the beginning. That's about it doesn't fit into the box. No. They don't recognize it doesn't fit into the box. So by you doing what you do um, and flowing with your ceremonies and your um, ability to bring people together in recognize the sacred, it's it's that's why it's special when it's outdoors in mm. nature. Mm. Mm, mm. because you're connecting yeah. to it all um mm. that's not to say i really love churches and i mm. really love the energy you can get in a church mm. um but it's just uh it's organized religion really that doesn't recognize the yeah other. i was going to say something naughty then and i think i probably will uh, <laughs> but i i, <laughs> I love I love I love cathedrals. Uh, I love churches. I love particularly high high church or Catholic churches, which have that gorgeous incense and the and the music mm. in the background and the candles. Catholic, so I know all about right. it. Right. So so I so I love all of that, and I particularly love them when they're empty of people because yeah. Yeah. because the trouble is is that that kind of energy of um, draw of, of duality which you do get in organized religion of us and them of, of we're in the light and you're in the dark and blah 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 what you know that's that somehow muddies it to me and, and yeah take I, people I, out my my um, <laughs> I, I come from an Irish family and my great aunt mm. Nora lived with the mm. priests and cooked for them and you know mm. lived in the house so she was next door to the church and she used to say to me Sarah Jane do you want to come up and um clean the church with me you know and i would think mm. clean the church that doesn't sound like fun does mm. it really and mm. my mother said no no sarah jane go with her because being in the church without anybody there is the best time to be in the yeah, church absolutely and uh, and i said oh all right then mum. i'd be like about 10 years old and i'd go up with her and of course when you go into a church and there's nobody in it and your auntie, your great aunt Nora is, you know, there and knows it like the back of her hand. She's going, mm. go up to the altar now. Go and clean behind the <laughs> altar. Well, because you can't go to the altar, can you, when you're in no, the congregation? Of course, yeah. So get yeah. that side of it. Oh, wow. Oh, my yeah. word. Oh, my yeah. word. Yeah. To sit, to get yeah. close, you know, to lift up the, the sort yeah. of linen pillow and see what's underneath yeah. and clean around. Oh, I loved it. And then and then mm. she said, now, she said, we just sit now. We just sit. And, of course, mm. when you sit quietly, you will know this. And there's nobody else there. The great big enormous stained glass windows. Mm. They actually have amazing, you know, roof space with paintings mm. on them. And yeah. there's so much to take in without uh, an actual mass going on. Mm. It's... Mm. Fa they're fabulous places, but mm, as you mm. said, much nicer without people in them. Or if you go, <laughs> or if you go to uh, another place, Mike, because because there was, you know, we were Irish Catholics, so we knew all these little places. There was the uh, enclosed convent, yeah, and the round the corner, and um, these enclosed. No, well, I couldn't get my head around the fact that we went, Mum and I, at eight o'clock in the morning, on a weekday, uh, sorry, seven o'clock in the morning. And we'd go into this little, you know, enclosed place and uh, into a tiny chapel. And then there would be behind the altar, uh, there would be a grid. Oh. And uh, you'd hear this amazing singing coming from behind the grid. And I said, Mummy, are they the angels? And she said, no. Well, she said, they are like angels, but there's nuns oh. behind there. They're, they never come out. I said, what do you mean oh. they never come out? Oh. And it's just... The world mm. is so strange. Mm. Now, that's quite beautiful, mm. those type of really early mm. morning masses mm. with, again, mm. hardly mm. any people, just the priests, mm. the nuns, mm. and one or two mm. people. Very mm. special. But anyway, mm. I digress. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm going to bring this to yeah. an end and say thank you mm -hmm. um, very much, Mark, for coming along and chatting to us because mm. 
to be a hedge priest is to be a very special person in the world that we live in now. And I personally um, am very grateful for what you do, even though I have not been called upon to um, utilize your skills. I <laughs> am so pleased that you yeah. exist and that you do what you do, because to be in the in-between spaces and places yeah. is to be something special. Thank you. No, it's been lovely, really. And I'm all the very best with the documentary. I think it'll be an amazing thing. Thank well, you. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm just going to stop recording now.